Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we are recording the session for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Feel free to post questions and comments during the session and we will try to get them answered online. We are particularly pleased to welcome our moderator, Tom Temin, the host of Federal Drive on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Let me turn over the reins to Tom to begin today's discussion. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Our guests today are Richard McKinney, the Chief Information Officer at the Transportation Department, Kirk Kern, the Chief Technology Officer at NetApp U.S. Public Sector, and Matt Livingston, Cloud Computing Architect for SAIC. It's great to have you all here with us. And this cloud computing deal has really become something big and real and ongoing for the federal government. Uh, the policy continues on, and I think the adoption of cloud computing is we're finally, finally seeing a baseline of adoptions from which this whole thing can accelerate. But it's unlikely that any agency is going to go 100 percent to the cloud, maybe a couple of very small ones, or 100 percent sticking with their own data centers, because both ways really don't fit with the policy that governs all this. So why don't we start by getting kind of a picture of how things look now. We'll start with Mr. McKinney from DOT. Tell us what the status is of cloud that you see in your agency, and that incorporates a lot of different bureaus, but also to some extent what, what your colleagues are seeing too, uh, to the extent that you know uh, across the government. Well, I think it'd be hard to uh, overstate the importance of cloud computing in our uh, IT modernization efforts and, and how we're trying, you know, our data center consolidation efforts. Uh, you know, there's there was a policy OMB, you know, this several years ago, cloud first, and um, we certainly don't do that because it's a policy. We think cloud first because we find that the challenges that we're facing often in the cloud just is the natural best fit for um, for making those changes. So, you know, especially as the cloud's gotten so much more mature and the the, the, the offerings out there are so, uh, so broad that uh, it seems like every time we have a challenge, we end up, uh, you know, exploring all of our cloud options first. And so what degree, what are the major applications at this point or the major pieces of computing you have in the cloud? Well, we're in the process of moving our entire mail and messaging store to Microsoft's uh, uh, Office 365 uh, cloud and uh, we're about halfway through that migration and uh, it's going really well. Okay, let's uh, talk with Kirk Kern, Chief Technology Officer at NetApp U.S. Federal and uh, you are a supplier of technology pieces of all this. What does it look like to you? The, yeah. What's the landscape like at this point? Well, you know, uh, you know I, I, s sitting at, uh, at NetApp we actually have the opportunity to see uh, across all the different branches of the government and their adoption and, and implementation of cloud technologies, and um, you know a, a real uh, a, a real opportunity to to kind of distill everything that we're seeing across the space right now is that we see that there's a unique set of opportunities for coexistence of both on-prem data centers as well as cloud consumption. I think initial mandates um, started off with you know a, a total migration of all assets into the cloud. And then through various reasons, maybe uh, the services that are required aren't available as a, in a cloud service provider, or there may be some data protection or data stewardship concerns that keep some of those assets home on-premise. And so we see the, the unique opportunity where we have coexistence of both on-prem um, on assets as well as public, public cloud consumption. And uh, moving forward, the, the, the agencies that have the uh, have the foresight to, to build infrastructures that can leverage the, the advantages of both on-prem and public, you know, uh, thus creating a hybrid cloud environment are ones that I think will really benefit by these technologies. So that implies that even as you modernize your own data centers or optimize them, you have to keep cloud in mind because it affects how you do that for your own, your own data centers. Yeah, absolutely. So as, uh, as you update existing infrastructures that are on-prem, you, you do so with an eye to the future so that they're cloud-enabled or cloud-aware. They have the, the capabilities to, you know, you know, do authentication with external services uh, for user authorization and access. You have the ability to move data into and out of these cloud resources and then ultimately to, you know, actually move things around in real time. Start to accept the, dynas the dynamic and elastic scaling properties of cloud as well, right? Many applications that are running on existing data centers today start with a piece of infrastructure that is 
fairly resilient and highly reliable, and so you have the opportunity to start that application and keep it running for some indeterminate period of time. However, when you move to the cloud, you know, things come, things go, things stop, things get restarted. And so you, as you rewrite applications to move to the cloud, you have to have to also embrace the stateless nature of cloud computing resources as well. So, you know, a little bit of software, a little bit of infrastructure, and then ultimately some policy has to get wrapped around all that as well. All right, it sounds like there's an educational aspect to this also for maybe some of the people that have been at it at the data center game for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been doing this for oh, almost 24 months now. And that's exactly what we found. We've actually developed a series of best practices where we go in and we can survey existing infrastructures and workloads, understand the demands that they have from an I.O. perspective, and then we use that as, as a predictor and, and a series of questions to you know, actually determine whether you can pick up these applications and move them to the cloud. And so the, you know, as we've gotten more, more and more sophisticated with these migrations and, and ports, we're, we're, we're understanding where the issues are and, and where they're not, right? And so we can literally go through a series of applications and pick off which ones we think you can move quickly, you know, without a lot of, a lot of effort, and other ones that are going to take some time, right, to actually invest either, you know, software development resources or maybe in some cases completely rewrite to move to the cloud. Okay, good, and we'll get into that more deeply as we move along here. Matt Livingston is the cloud computing architect at SAIC, services-oriented type of company. I don't want to say service-oriented. That has a technical meaning, but you offer services to customers. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of cloud adoption and how agencies are approaching it? So in, in our role as a cloud services integrator, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing very, we're seeing very similar trends across our customer base. Uh, so we've seen virtualization and that those technologies allow people to hit a lot of their data center consolidation milestones and now looking towards the next steps in that consolidation uh, public cloud technology private cloud as well as hybrid architectures are allowing us to further consolidate data centers and find efficiencies within the existing data centers um, so we, we're also seeing a interest in our customer base in uh, a model that allows contractor-owned, contractor-operated cloud offerings to be placed inside government facilities behind government networks, which allows government agencies and the Department of Defense to leverage some of, the, some of their security uh, investments that they've made on the government networks while allowing them to adopt some of the new emerging technology that's coming out of industry. Did you say contractor-owned and contractor-operated within an agency premise? Correct. So, so the concept here would be physical security, uh, boundary protection provided by the agency or the department, uh, but the actual infrastructure platform and software as a service provided by a contractor-owned capability. So mm -hmm. hel helps uh, solve some of the acquisition challenges uh, and allowing our customers to potentially adopt new technology coming out of industry more rapidly than they would be, be able to do otherwise. Well, I've seen Dunkin' Donuts within within agency premises, so why not a data center operated by, uh, by you know, contractors also yes. and owned by them? So um, I'd like to kind of just um, follow up with what Matt had said. You know, from a vendor perspective, we're actually seeing a lot of the, those same, uh, same concepts being re reflected back into us as well. Um, you, you know, customers have gotten accustomed to buying service or consuming uh, an IT resource, you know, kind of pay as you drink. And uh, when, we, when, when they approach us, they've asked similar questions. Hey, what is your on-premise cloud model, right? They don't want to own infrastructure any longer. You know, do you have a utility model in place where we basically you know, place that infrastructure on-prem, uh, they pay for the consumption of those resources, and then ultimately we're, we, we maintain title and fiduciary responsibilities for the gear on-prem. Richard, how does that play, uh, how does that sound to you, the idea of an on-premise contractor-owned cloud? or data, I guess it's a data center at that point, but uh, operates as a cloud functionally. Totally comfortable with that. You know, I, don't, I, wouldn't, see, I wouldn't see any uh, problem with uh, entering into that kind of an agreement. Where do you find the space, though? Does, uh, agencies are kind of getting the squeeze on physical space in the last few years, too. Issue or? Part of this is some, some of the existing facilities, the physical footprint has shrunk as things have been virtualized, as things have been consolidated as more applications and services have been moved to, to enterprise shared services. So that's actually freed up data center floor space and existing data centers as, as well as vacating entire data centers in, in some cases. Yeah, that, the Microsoft migration I talked about, that's going to free up a lot of floor space, yeah. a lot. 
Yeah, let's get back to that for a minute. That's kind of the foundational application that early on people were saying they were moving. DOT is still in the process of changing. And uh, I guess maybe people got the idea that moving something as fundamental as email was an easy lift. But apparently there's a lot more to it than it sounds, just by, than going with 365 or Google right. Mail or whatever any of the variants well, it, out there know, are. It depends. It depends on where, where you start from. For example, um, FAA moved to the cloud with their email last year uh, into a Microsoft Cloud. It was a DITAR environment, but they were coming from a Lotus Notes uh, uh, environment, so and, and it, it was very prehistory. Right? It was that was a very uh, difficult lift for them and and transition. Whereas uh, on the other side of DOT, with the, the operating administrations that were using our services, we have a very mature uh, and consolidated uh, Microsoft Exchange environment. So. Picking it up and moving it to the Microsoft clouds has been a lot easier. Uh, we uh, uh, we were uh, in a very good position to be able to just do that. And you know, the long and the short of it is the users are not really even going to notice anything on the day they get migrated over. They won't know anything really happened. It'll look the same as it it always has for them. And so, what are the advantages that you expect from doing this when it's completed? Well, cost. Uh, you know, there's no way we could do mail at the cost that, w that we're going to pay for it, so we're going to save some money. We think it's a more secure approach. There's some, there's some, some feature sets that you're, we're going to be able to get uh, as part of this migration. For example, we're moving as part of this where it's also Skype for Business and SharePoint, so w there's some, some feature functionality that uh, we're going to uh, acquire as a part of this that... Uh, makes the migration very attractive. And uh, when you do make that transition, you still have your Active Directory database. How does that get maintained? Is that still a DOT? That's something that we'll continue to maintain. And um, you know, we sat down with the engineers from Microsoft, and they went through our Active Directory uh, uh, instance and gave us their advice on uh, you know, any changes we need to make, they actually, took, you know, we got a, a very good report card saying your Active Directory is very clean, and uh, and uh, should migrate quite easily. And you know, like I say, we're part way through that. We've moved a whole bunch of test uh, uh, accounts over, and everything's gone smoothly. I guess a clean one is also a, a somewhat more secure one than if you had a lot of dead accounts on there that people could use in some manner. Right. Right. Exactly. All right, so uh, let's talk about security for a minute. Uh, that's you know, like the number two question that comes after you know, yes or no on cloud. And, and so how do you ensure that in a hybrid environment that whatever uh, security virtue the agency thinks that it has, that the cloud provider also has, and so there's some match up there, some assurance there, or maybe the cloud provider is better? So um, I guess I'll take the first swing at that. The, I think fundamentally the technology um, around cloud services and even on-prem services is fairly mature. Um, r rarely do uh, have I seen exploits where it's a direct attack against the technology, whether it be an encryption service or an authentication service. A majority of the breaches tend to revolve around social engineered attacks, very simplistic, you know, you know, uh, approaches where you know either an employee inadvertently gives out his username, password. Or you know they, they've done some other things where you know they click on a link that's probably nefarious in in in, in origin, but um, I think as part of this migration to the cloud requires some indoctrination of the employees to recognize the fact that hey that, that you know these assets are now remote and you're less protected than you you could potentially be by having all your your assets within sort of the the perimeter of your of your facility, and so there's a there's a bit of opsec required I'm sorry operational security. Um, there's a bit of operational security that's required that, you know, just I think everyone needs to raise their game, so to speak, as they start to embrace these hybrid environments. And Matt, you mentioned the COCO that's on-premise, and so what is the security posture in a situation like that? So in, in a situation like that, the all of the same authorizations that a federal federal agency or a DOD agency would, would require are, are still going to be a requirement for that environment. and. In this case, it, it allows some of the existing investments in security that have already been made to be leveraged for the network stacks, for the boundary stacks. Uh, 
Also, one of the things that's making it easier in our customer space is with the Department of Defense adopting the, the NIST risk management framework, makes it a lot easier to gain reciprocity between different agencies and different entities that are adopting cloud services, sharing data center space, you know, sharing community clouds. Um, so that with the, with the Department of Defense following the same framework as the, the rest of the federal government, that makes it a lot easier to consolidate and make shared investments. Yeah, Richard, what was your what was your thought on on cybersecurity with that mail? I imagine that uh, in some case in some architectures, it's hard to propagate uh, password changes across all these mixed environments and, and mishmash that a lot of agencies had. But where it's all in one place now, that might actually enable greater security measures for individual employees. Yeah, my take on and my observation is that the the mature cloud service providers are offering. Uh, you know, a degree of around security that you know. I th I think it, our security is in is in our posture is in, is strengthened by moving to cloud services. I you know I just you know they 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 spend a, a great deal of money and and uh, put a, 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 the safeguards in place to uh, uh, protect us better than I think we could have done ourselves. Back to what Kirk said about you know. A lot of the, the the breaches are coming around the social engineering aspect, and th that you know that's th that ball's still in our court, and that's something that we still have to deal with, and that's something that we're working on to to, uh, uh, to educate our users about uh, you know how to how to how to be out you know on the web and be using using the internet and and, stay, and staying safe. All right, on that note, we will take a short break here. Our guests today are Richard McKinney, the CIO at the Transportation Department. Kirk Kern is the Chief Technology Officer at NetApp U.S. Public Sector. And Matt Livingston is the Cloud Computing Architect for SAIC. I'm your host and moderator, Tom Temin. This is Leveraging Hybrid Cloud Architectures to Deliver Federal IT, sponsored by NetApp and SAIC, here on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. <laughs> 